deal of scripture that is still linguistically, culturally, historically very foreign to us. The, one of my favorite scholars used to point out that to understand the Bible, it's not enough to enter into the mind of our best theologians. It's not enough to understand what they were saying in the 17th century or to know the decrees of the popes. To understand scripture, you have to get into the mind of the ancient Jew. And that's pretty hard, <laughs> even for a modern Jew. <laughs> the Unseen World of the Bible, session six. Wow. The word, the name, and the angel. Oh, I have some objectives for today. First of all, by the end of this session, you'll be able to identify who the angel of the Lord really was. Uh, secondly, I hope that we'll be able to describe what God's appearances looked like. And thirdly, we'll be able to explain how the Son of God appeared in the Old Testament. We know what he appeared like in the New Testament. Remember, you can always download the written form of this content as well as the PowerPoint slides from this site. The lesson theme for today, as we found it in our book, God appearing as a man is actually a pattern in the Old Testament long before his arrival as Jesus of Nazareth. These, these ideas and these verses are the connection between the two testaments, <coughs> between ancient Judaism and Messianic Judaism, sometimes called Christianity. So, I'm going to do, deal with this in two parts, uh, the word, the name, and the angel in the first testament. So, to get into this, we'll start with a verse we looked at last time. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set boundaries for the peoples, according to the number of the sons of God. For the Lord's portion is his people, and Jacob is allotted inheritance. Okay, following the incident with the Tower of Babel, the Lord scattered the nations, setting boundaries on their ethnicity, and assigned one of the members of the divine councils to be in charge of the various peoples. We want to point out the term nations here, goyi, many of you know the term. This is going to come up again and again in some of the following verses, as well as these phrases, mankind, literally the children of Adam, and the peoples, the am. We'll try to summarize this with the statement that Yahweh forsook the nations to start a new one. So he said, send all the nations into around the world, but he chose a people of his own. In fact, they weren't, what the people didn't even exist yet. It had to start with one couple. We back up then to Genesis chapter 12, where this, this new storyline starts up. The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, what do we know about Abram at that point in his history? What was his religious background? Pagan. Pagan. Pagan possibly a worshiper of the moon, uh, being from the city of Ur, which has been... Uh, and so he was actually to get out of the household. It's going to take him a while because, as my friends used to tell me in Africa, you can never do enough for your parents. You will never abandon them. In fact, it was a hindrance to preaching the gospel. How can I go preach the gospel? I could never come back to my village because I would be in disgrace. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. Right. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Yes, a great nation. There's that word goy again, it's one of the goyim. The Jews are Gentiles. <laughs> <laughs> and Gentiles can become Jews, which is amazing. 
And you yourself are going to be the source of what I intend to do amongst the nations. So right from the time of sending them away, putting them under other gods, and choosing uh, Abraham, his intention from the start was to bring the nations back to himself. His uh, primary objective down through the centuries. From that point on, he believed God's promises and was counted to him as righteousness, but there was one more step. That was the step of obedience to express that faith. Uh, I will curse those who curse you. This is one reason why Iran is in such trouble right now. And all of the people, some of you know the term mishpachot, the family, there's the plural form. So God's intention is to get right down into the clan structure of all of the tribes, of all of the peoples of the earth. Many conclude that the Lord Jesus Christ will not return until every clan, every family system on earth has those who worship the Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Uh, that makes sense. It was Canaan, <laughs> but not yet occupied by uh, the family of Abraham. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. All right. Is this audio or is this visual? <laughs> well, oh, Lord, yeah. Here. And so the question comes up in the mind, at least in the Westerner, what can God look like since he's invisible? Well, it should become clearer. So what did Abraham do? So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Right. And who appeared to him? Let's make it very clear. This is Yahweh himself. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Peculiar language. And... Hebrew readers themselves thought that this was a rather startling thing to say, that the word of the Lord <coughs> came in a vision. Well, what does a word look like? Yeah. I mean, myself, I've never seen one except in print. It's a, it's a concept that when God communicates himself, it's audible and it's visual. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Right. Uh, what would he be afraid of? He's saying the Lord. <laughs> All right, he's seeing God. That would be quite frightening. I, some JWs came to the door once, and I said as they were leaving, I'm going to pray that the Lord appear to you. <laughs> and the guy turned around and said, that would be frightening. <laughs> um, even more frightening, if you are from a, uh, a traditional tribal society, and you leave to travel across country and another, men from another tribe find you out traveling alone, what might they do? Yeah, you probably wouldn't survive. So there were many things to be afraid of. Mr. Snow? I was going to say, I guess God appears to however he wants, but I'm trying to compare that when he appeared to Moses and said, you can't look at me because you'll burn up. Right. And he didn't, and Abram didn't burn up. I'm just trying okay. to yes, understand. All right. I, I hope that this lesson will clarify that dilemma. On one hand, you're not allowed to see God. On the other hand, he appears. And the scriptural language itself is trying to solve that issue for us. And one of the hints, right here is in, right in this verse, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. That's a way of saying, the Lord didn't come. The word came. He also said to him, I am Yahweh. Get the point here? The word comes, but the word turns around and says, I'm Yahweh. Okay, I mean, this was a puzzling to the ancient readers about as much as it is to us. The word appears and speaks to Abraham, calling himself Yahweh. I mean, you can hear the Gospel of John already ringing in your mind. Yeah. And the word is Jesus. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Okay. Three what? Yeah. Men. What does the Hebrew say? Three men. <laughs> <laughs> One of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. 
and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. So this figure, this appearance of a man, is able to communicate and to speak, and now is going to perform a deed that only what could accomplish? God. Only God could accomplish. It would be a year hence, and so you've got time now to watch and see if this is going to happen. It's important that it's more than a year hence to be sure that Sarah is not already pregnant. If the sneaky spirit knew that, he could pretend that he's going to make it happen. Like Columbus calling on the uh, darkening the sun because he had a, an almanac that told him what day the eclipse of the sun was going to occur. So God and angels appear as men, human beings. When the man got up to leave, they looked toward Sodom and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? All right, if we had any question of who these men were, the text tells us that one of them was Yahweh. Yes? Well, what I find interesting is that in verse 1, it's talking about I am, it's a singular singular yeah. thing, I, mm -hmm. but now we're talking about three people being there. Instead of one. Later, two of them will be identified as angels. The angels that go into Sodom and rescue Lot and part of his household. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. It, iterating what he had uh, promised earlier, and again, all nations, it's plural. Now, the angels are on their way at that very moment to destroy a city and possibly a people. But at the same time, he says, I still have a plan for all the peoples on earth. And I'm, I'm going to accomplish this through Abraham and his descendants, having just given the promise of a coming son. So, one of the three men is Yahweh himself who earlier had been identified as the Word. Everybody loves the story of little Samuel at the tabernacle. His mother would come every year with new clothes and show her love for him. But something happened while he was still a lad, possibly a young teen, not sure. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. Okay, so if you can't see the red type, what stands out to you? <laughs> he stood there. And so this tells us something. He was in uh, apparently an invisible form, and in such a form that he had his feet on the ground, or whatever goes for feet, and starts a conversation with Samuel. Now, since you know the story, we don't have to go into the details of that, so let's jump down to verse... 21. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Okay. Uh, notice, he <coughs> didn't reveal to Samuel his word. He revealed himself to Samuel through the word. Okay, so Yahweh reveals himself through the word in a perceptible way that humans were able to see and hear him. All humans? No. no, but those whom he had chosen. So, Yahweh appears as a man through his word. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Now, it seems rather peculiar. Why would you get into a wrestling match with some guy along the road when you're traveling. Yeah. I wouldn't. <laughs> he started it. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to promise him for sure. <laughs> right. Uh, now I have sat of a night around the bonfire on the Sahara Desert with the surrounded with Tuatic tribals. And in the <coughs> evening around the fire, you know what you do? Besides telling stories? Feats of strength and acrobatics and wrestling because it's great sport 
and with no electronics, you don't even know what an electronic is, you'll find more human ways to entertain yourselves. And so for him to get into a wrestling match with someone along the way, his appearance of a similar tribal background, you might do that. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Right. Right. Bene is uh, face, and uh, El, of course, is the ancient, most ancient name of God. So ben I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Why would he add that last phrase? Because I was going to die if you If you ever saw God, or any Elohim, that might be your end. In fact, if you start to see gods, you've probably already passed over. <laughs> so Yahweh dealt with Jacob as man to man. And of course, again, reiterated the promises that had earlier been made to his father, Abram, Abraham. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked faithfully the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. Right, okay, so Jacob now is in turn blessing uh, his sons and his grandsons in this case, and he makes this equation, may the God before whom my fathers walked faithfully the angel who has delivered me from all harm. And you remember he was in some serious trouble from time to time, even in fear of uh, the life, his own life, as well as that of his household. But he recognizes that there was this being whom he had met, was the God of his fathers, but in some sense was also an angel. Um, so we capitalize the term angel here in our language. No? Is that the term or the word that you use mes as messenger? Yes. Uh, we only translate messenger when we're dealing with a human person who carries a message. In the Bible, when we're dealing with a divine person who carries a message, we translate it angel. But we're going to modify our definition of angel very shortly. What do we conclude? Jacob equates God with the divine angel whom he had met at Bethel. Let's deal here for a moment with the angel of the Lord. What we're going to do now is a tiny, a three minute tiny group work. And we're going to you have five sets of us. And so set A, we'd like you to look up Genesis 16, seven to nine in the Bible about Hagar. <coughs> what she, we learned about the angel of the Lord. Set B, look up what Genesis 28 says in regard to Jacob. Set C, look up Moses in Exodus 3, 1 through 5. And then D, uh, Joshua chapter 5. Or, and then you folks over here, Gideon in Judges chapter 6. So in your tiny group, uh, read the passage aloud and observe details about the angel, his appearance, and his identity. You have three minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much for your cooperation. Uh, so, uh, Group A, what did you learn about the appearance, what the angel looked like, his identity, and any other details? He, he was able to be seen, and he could speak and be understood, and he understood what people said. This vision that he had came to him in a drink. Right. And so he saw a great stairway, right. you know, uh, leading up to heaven with angels ascending and uh, descending, right. but with the Lord standing at the top right. of, of the great stairway. Right. And again, 
you know, the Lord was telling Jacob the same thing he told Abraham mm -hmm. and Isaac that he would make this land right. theirs. Okay. So, the angel of the Lord, I mean, he appears amongst angels. You get the point? But he's at the top of the ladder. He's the big angel. <laughs> and he's identified, and again, he's not only visible in, in vision form, but he is audible for that. All right, group C. Well, we have the audiovisual again. He appeared and he spoke. Yeah. And uh, we have flames, yep. a non burning bush. Uh, right. The charismatic. Yeah. He didn't appear as a man. Yeah, as a man. It's interesting, within the burning bush, you have the angel of the Lord and Yahweh equated. Now, the flame, Scripture does say that he makes his angels, his ministers, flames of fire, and he makes them winds that blow. And so you have a similar instance, other places in Scripture, but especially on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descends onto the church, he comes down with angels in audio-visual form. Um, all right, D. You have this military commander armed with swords of battle about ready to slay Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as, as Yahweh, uh, it says, the commander of the host of Yahweh said to Joshua. Yes, okay. Well, who would command Probably the armies Michael. of Yahweh. Probably Michael. He's the six-star general. He's the commander-in-chief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Michael would probably be a, a major, but yeah. <laughs> the general. Right. Well, I went back into verse 11, because there it says the, the angel of the Lord appeared and sat at a tree. Yeah. And then as we went farther, he spoke and appeared and talked to Gideon, yes. then he had a, uh, a staff in his hand, right. which uh, fire came out of that burned up the uh, offering, right. and then Gideon said, you know, basically, woe is me, I, I'm going to die because I saw the Lord face to face. And, and then the Lord says, no, you're not going to die. He'll be okay. says he's making the way clear. There are some manifestations of the living word, Yahweh himself, that will not result in your death. It's possible to meet God face to face and live. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Well, isn't that nice? I'm going to stay safe in heaven and send an angel ahead of you. However, we still have to identify who this angel was. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him, for he will not forgive the rebellion since my name is in him. He does not forgive rebellion. Apparently, he has some power to forgive, but there's some things he will not forgive. And my name dwells in him. This angel carries the very name of Yahweh. Scripture is going to help us solve this apparent mystery. Conundrum. <laughs> Conundrum. All right. Anyway, this angel led humans, demanding obedience from them and carrying the name of Yahweh. Or Yahweh. That particular Hebrew letter, it's like Spanish. If, there's, if it's surrounded by vowels, you vocalize it rather from wa to va. They've been brought into the land, led by this angel for some 40 years, and here's what Joshua reports. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our parents up and out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. The angel who led them across the desert, protected them, brought them into the land, we now, we now find out, we learn who he was. Who was he? Yahweh. It was Yahweh, our God himself, who brought us across. So in way of summary then, the angel of the Lord, Yahweh, is Yahweh himself in human form, 
doing the works of God. And so who was it that was appearing to Moses face to face? Yahweh or in the context the angel of the Lord. Isaiah says something interesting in this connection relating to a future time. See the name of the Lord comes from afar with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath and his tongue is a consuming fire. Notice the name of the Lord comes from afar. He couldn't, couldn't the text have just simply said, the Lord himself comes from afar? Could have. It would still be true. But for some reason, the scripture says the name of the Lord. Now, Jewish interpreters have not been lax. They have made some observations about this and <clears throat> have given us some linguistic patterns that are brought actually into the New Testament. I think you'll catch that when you see it. But just for the moment, the name of Yahweh will come angry, pouring out wrath. Will Messiah Jesus ever do such a thing? Yes. Yeah, that's coming. And this name, the term here in Hebrew is Hashem, is the equivalent to God amongst the Jews. Now why did we hyphenate the word God? When Jewish people write the word God, they typically leave out the vowel to show great honor, respect, and deference to the one true God whom they're, they're talking about. We, we nasty old Gentiles, we don't seem to have any sensitivity. <laughs> we just blurt out the name Yahweh. <clears throat> Is that all right? No. It's not? <laughs> Depends on the context. It's a, it's a, okay. Yeah, yeah, depending on context. Sure. <laughs> all right, we'd like to stop for a moment and try to refine our definition of angel for a moment. Uh, someone said earlier, angel, that means messenger. Well, yes. Did angels always bring a message? Sometimes they just did things. But they were, they were sent by Yahweh. But we'd like to suggest that angels are created divine beings, in the scholarly sense of the word divine. In other words, they are Elohim, who perform service or deliver messages on behalf of Yahweh, sometimes appearing in human form. And so uh, this is why in our European languages we like to have a separate word, angel, to distinguish it from mere messenger. Otherwise we'd have to capitalize it or something. And now a better definition of the angel of the Lord. Here's my suggestion. We can argue about it or we can uh, critique it. <coughs> Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, this is Yahweh himself appearing in human form, commissioning leaders, guarding his people, or wreaking vengeance on his enemies. So in a sense, he, he delivers his own mail. The messenger who is the Lord himself. Yes. When we use the title, the angel of the Lord, singular, the angel of the Lord, that's Yahweh himself. But he has many servants, spirits, whom he sends out to deliver messages and to do work for him in the earth. And Gabriel is one of those other angels, as I understand it. And he usually says, an angel of the Lord, not the angel. An angel, not the angel. Right. Okay. I went to the Jewish Encyclopedia this morning. Now, we have, what we have not talked about here are some of the Aramaic terms for the word, word. But there are uh, three terms found in the Jewish scriptures, two of the, one in Aramaic, one in Hebrew, and the other in Greek. Uh, Jewish scriptures were transmitted to us up until the times of Jesus through three lineages, a Hebrew lineage, an Aramaic lineage, and a Greek lineage, all three of them within the Jewish community. So you have the term ma'amar, which means word, and the Hebrew term uh, dibur, which means a word, and then the Greek term logos, which means a word. Well, I shouldn't say it means. Those are just glosses. 
When you give a one-word equivalent in one language to a one-word in another language, it's not a definition. It's just a useful term. Because these words occur in contexts that bring more meaning to it. Anyway, here's the note that they gave us. The memra, which is a common modern way of pronouncing the almost impronounceable Aramaic, because it has a little guttural letter right in the middle of it. The creative or directive word or speech of God manifesting his power in the world of matter and mind, a term used especially in the Targum as a substitute for the Lord, when an anthropomorphic expression is to be avoided. That's heavy language, meaning basically this. In uh, the literature of Judaism, when we are, we're talking about the great, wonderful works of God, we'll use his names and titles. But when he is coming down to a lower level and dealing with sin and wickedness and demons and so forth, or doing things like creating streams and fields and animals, that's so low. That's degrading the name of Yahweh. Instead of using the divine name, we will use an expression such as the word, or the word of the Lord, to help mentally separate Yahweh from the physical world. It's a kind of dualism. Now, because scripture itself uses expressions such as the word came, or the angel of the Lord came, or the, uh, the name of Yahweh was in the angel, uh, they were able to do the same thing in Jewish literature. And so this concept of the, the membra is very important in biblical uh, scholarly studies when we come to interpret the New Testament in terms of the Old and the intervening Jewish literature, uh, far beyond what we'll usually typically get into in an evangelical Sunday school class. But here's an example. Someone read for us Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. This is one of the key verses for understanding Genesis uh, 1, 2. The spirit of the Lord was hovering over the deep. <coughs> Question for translators is, should we translate that spirit or translate it as wind? A great wind from God was blowing over the waters. Well, this verse seems to suggest that the term word is in Hebrew parallelism, breath of his mouth. But again, we're stuck here. Well, blowing <laughs> or speaking? But in any event, this was cited by the encyclopedia as an example of how the scripture itself tends to protect Yahweh by keeping him linguistically separate from things down here. But in this case, it's the starry host and the heavens were made. So something about the word, this word that appeared to humans, was very busy in the heavens as well. The starry host, this is that term host, that is typical in scripture to represent the armies of heaven, all the angelic beings, or the divine council, as we tend to say these days. Well, let's get into the New Testament, the word, the name, and the angel. And of course, we can't go very far before we recite the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So if we had grown up in Judaism, uh, back in the uh, first century of the Common Era, we would be so familiar with the language of the Bible and of other Jewish literature that use such terms as word and name and angel to talk about our God. And we read this verse, what would it say to us? Would this be puzzling? Jesus is the Word. Yeah. 
Exactly. So to come out and say that in the beginning, the Word was already there, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and say, well, yes, we know that. Now, of course, if you were not Jewish, and you were pagan, you have a Greek background, and maybe you love listening to the philosophers, the philosophers also talked about the Logos, but in a somewhat similar but different sense. That is, whatever the cosmic reality is, or the divinities behind or above uh, this physical plane, when those divinities communicate into the human situation, it is the mind of God being expressed to us. The first meaning of Logos was thought, or mind, or reflection. And secondarily, the expression of that thought where others can perceive it, hear it. And so whether you were Jewish or whether you were Greek, when you read this verse, it was communicating something that you already understand. So why is this verse important? Foundations of the beginning of Jesus was always with God. They were one, inseparable. Well, you're doing theology. <laughs> Let's jump down to verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right. So this great word that we've understood for centuries is taken on now something more. Not just visible, not just audible, not just doing stuff around us, but now he, he becomes genuine humanity. The reason for which Christians say he was fully God, he was fully man, or human. Again, we have seen this glory, but now John is going to change the vocabulary somewhat. He's going to begin talking about the Son. The word that appeared in the First Testament was the second person of the Godhead. Godhead being our term for the, tr the one true divinity. So, just by way of illustration, let's suppose that the great eternal everlasting existence that explains everything else, we'll call Yahweh for a moment. And so Yahweh surrounds everything in time and space and beyond. <clears throat> Within the purposes of Yahweh, he creates a material world with lots of planets and galaxies and so forth, which are yet to be tamed, we have outside of the creation the Word, who now we're going to call the Son. But this is still God invisible. So now there is the world existing, surrounded by the ultimate reality, invisible God. But he comes down into history. And he reveals himself in an audiovisual form, for example, in the angel of the Lord, multiple times, many times, to avoid the millennial term multiple. The, uh, but then when we come to the New Testament, he reveals himself now as the Son, the Lord incarnate. He was the angel of the Lord, now we are, he is the Lord incarnate. So rather than appearing as a man, he now appears a human. But well, Jesus, he wasn't finished at this point. He goes on in his great prayer of chapter 17. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So what was Jesus' understanding about himself? Existence. Yes, he's eternally existent, but in distinction to the Father, they shared the glory, the, all the attributes of God. So now he comes down to earth in human form, and here's what he says he has accomplished. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. Yeah. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Right, your, your NIV Bible says, I have revealed you. They made explicit, 
the implied information. But the Greek itself says, I made known to them your name. Now, does that mean that Jesus is going around saying, hey, 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 his real name is Yahweh. Why H-W-H? Okay, got it now? So when you go door to door, you are to introduce yourself as Yahweh's witnesses. He's saying something more than that. Uh, he is revealing the Father himself, whom he here, here calls the name. But then they have obeyed your word. Now this is interesting. In other words, uh, hey, they're, going, they're running around now obeying all the Ten Commandments. Is that what they were doing? No. What word did they obey? The teachings of Jesus are included. But in the Gospel of John, remember John himself, the way he reports the, the teachings of Jesus, he's developing themes. And one of the recurring themes of the Gospel of John is this divine word, this logos. Sometimes using another word, rhema, as a synonym. So he may be saying here, you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word, the word that you sent into the world in human form. So Jesus reveals the name himself being the word who came into the world. This is why Colossians can say, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So this son is now taking the role of the word, being one and the same. Jesus rules as the image of God, having preeminence over all other beings. In Ephesians 6, 12, we all know, 11 rather, we all know well, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is why life is so tough. Not simply because of the fall. Not simply because of the descent of the sons of God, defiling the human race. But we're still engaged in the battle. You know, Christ has taken the victory, he's preeminent. Although the spiritual battle still rages, we have effective resources by faith in Christ. Now, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 makes an interesting observation. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, in the context of Paul, when he talks about the rulers of this age, does he mean the emperor? No. The emperor is a mere toady to the real, real rulers who are in the invisible realm. Now, did the forces of evil, and even the demons, did they recognize Jesus as the, the Messiah? Yes. And the Holy One was to come. But what did they not know about Jesus? That he was God. Well, actually, they intended to kill him. Right. And when he was crucified, they thought they had won. Right. And when he descended into hell, temporarily, they thought that he had now come down to their realm. Resurrection. Well, the resurrection would follow to declare, I've conquered death, I'm out of here, but you guys, you, you stay behind. And he takes the believers with him into the heavenly realm. But here's what they did not understand. The evil spiritual rulers knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but not that his death would free us from their dominion nullifying their authority. So he, Hebrew, Ephesians, another verse says, God is revealing through the church his wisdom to these rulers. Every time a Gentile comes to faith in Christ, 
the rulers over those Gentiles have lost more of their power. We'll terminate here with Hebrews chapter 2. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives long were held in slavery to that great fear whom we call death. We who belong to Jesus Christ, evil spirits cannot rule us without our permission. So, but to conclude then, the Lord of the underworld still seeks to kill human beings before they can hear and believe the good news.